Welcome to the first of Elysium Theatre Company's Shakespeare podcasts, part of the Durham Shakespeare Festival 2023. Recorded with Durham University to mark the 400th anniversary of the publication of the first folio of the complete works, we present interviews with some of the leading Shakespearean actors and scholars in the UK. I'm Jake Murray, Artistic Director of Elysium Theatre Company, and with me is Sir Derek Jacobi. Sir Derek, thank you for joining us. Tell us a little bit about um, uh, how you became an actor and how you discovered your passion for Shakespeare. Oh, yeah. Well, it goes back a long way. Um, born East London, um, only child, uh, and my parents were both uh, working. My, I'm, I'm quite old now, so I didn't see my father until I was about four years old because he was in the army. Um, and I had really little connection with uh, literature or the arts. Um, but then at a very early age, um, I, I must have been just out of kindergarten, I suppose. Um, in my nursery school, I, I played uh, a thing called the, the Prince and the Swine Herd. It was a dual role. Um, I played the prince and the swine herd. And I suppose at that moment, um, the penny dropped um, and I decided that I enjoyed myself. I enjoyed this acting bit. And then I, I went to school and um, I acted at school um, in, in classroom bits and pieces. And then I went to grammar school and that's really where, where it all took off because we had a very enterprising English master um, and he directed the school plays. And uh, at the age of 18, 17, 17, I played Hamlet at school. And uh, very enterprisingly, he took us, the school um, the cast of Hamlet, up to the Edinburgh Festival. And we played on the fringe of the Edinburgh Festival in 19... 1957, I think it was, um, and from that, uh, I got called to the Royal Court Theatre in London, um, but I was just on my way to university. I, I got into Cambridge, and so I went to see um, George Devine at the Royal Court, and uh, they said, well, well, we'll keep an eye on you while you're at university, and um, uh, go with our blessing. So um, off I went to Cambridge. And that was the kind of, that was my drama school, really. Um, I studied history, supposedly. Um, that was my ticket into the university, but I acted all the time. The Marlowe Society, the ADC, um, and the the, uh, the college drama company. And uh, that's really, I suppose, where, well, the Shakespeare had already started with the school Hamlet. But that's where Shakespeare really took over my life, rather. And I played Hamlet again at uh, university, which we then took on tour to Europe in the vacation. And we were playing in Switzerland. And out front was um, a very famous actor called Richard Burton. And Richard Burton um, came round at the end of the show and said, uh, do you want to be a professional actor? Uh, if you do, I'll help you. Amazing. And I didn't I didn't actually need his help. Um, and I eventually acted in a film with him. I, I hope you're getting the impression that really I've been the luckiest actor you will ever meet. It kind of all fell into place with my desires and the opportunity to fulfill those desires as far as acting was concerned. Um, it just kept happening for me. Um, at, at university, I again played Hamlet. I played him nearly 500 times in that. Um, and while I was playing Hamlet, um, we went to, uh, well, I, I was at the, um, but was it the, no, it was the University Hamlet. And we did it at the Open Air Theatre at Stratford-on-Avon. Yes. And uh, it was while we were doing, I didn't know, but the big wigs from the Birmingham Rep came it, um, Birmingham only being 20 odd miles from Stratford. So when my eventual, at the end of my Cambridge three years, I sent various begging letters to various rep companies around 
the country because that's what I decided I wanted to do. Um, sod history, um, I wanted to act. And uh, so when my begging letter arrived on the desk of the big wigs at Birmingham, they said, well, this is, this is the boy we saw playing Hamlet at Stratford. Let's, let's see him. So they, they called me in, they interviewed me and gave me a job. And I stayed at Birmingham for three years. Uh, again, luck, because after the first year, the director left and the new director, when he came in, got rid of all the old director's company, except the oldest and the youngest. Right. Again, luck. I was the youngest. So I kept my job for another two years. I mean, that's a, it's a fascinating story of, of, of the journey. And I think you highlight the, 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 the legendary inspired English teacher, who I think for a lot of oh, yes. a lot of actors and directors, I had a, mine was a German teacher who gave me my first directing job, which was a, a production of, would you believe it, Samuel Beckett's Endgame at the age of six. Good heavens. Uh, my father was inspired by a English teacher. And I think, I think those teachers who are able to convey the excitement of acting and of Shakespeare yeah, a really fundamental role in 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 in, our, in a lot of people's beginning, and that can yeah. any background. Yeah, and I also um, ha had the ability to uh, take you abroad. I mean, you got me to a festival, and that you know his reach was far, and it was it was wonderful. And that kind of that sort of luck has dogged my career because um, the end of Birmingham. Um, uh, where at the end of the three, I was playing leading roles in Birmingham by that time. And, you know, one Saturday matinee, um, I'm playing Hamlet again. <laughs> um, and Lawrence Olivia is out front. Nobody knows in the cast. He comes around afterwards. And I meet him, and I, he gave me a job the second season at Chichester. And it was that season that became the first national theatre. That's right. And I have been in for seven years. I mean, I think I think the the, the world of theatre you describe. Uh, I, I came and started in my my career in the nineties, uh, when uh, when there'd already been fifteen years of cuts, uh, but there was still a hugely vibrant theatre eco ecology. Yeah, you know, and I think people like Laurence Olivier going somewhere like Birmingham and finding an actor. Um, there was so much going on in the country then. Yes, there was. Yeah. And the ladder for actors was very exciting and people were looking for talent. So it's fascinating to think about how theatre has changed. So obviously Hamlet's played quite a big role for you um, in, in your life. <laughs> you could say that. How did you, then, as a teenager, did you feel that you were fish to water or was it hard? I think fish to water really describes it. I, I, I never found it difficult, no. I never found it kind of esoteric and uh, hard to get into the mind of the, both the writer and and the character, I think. I think what I discovered quite early on was not to be afraid of the language, um, to treat all the poetry as prose and all the prose as poetry. Yes, and um, not and to go for the sense um, of of the line and the thought and the thought behind the line. Um, which uh, often changes, well, it has to change, because whatever you speak, apart from the soliloquies, um, is in reply to someone else speaking to you. Now, they might not speak to you with the same inflections or the same intonations uh, <clears throat> that you had rehearsed in your own head, but you have to react to what you get. Yes. And that keeps it alive. And d don't not to be intimidated by the fact that um, one line rhymes with another line. And don't be a slave to pentameter. Don't, don't um, think, you know, this, this is the sacred text. This is venerated. This is really the wisdom of the ages. No, 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 no. Um, it's just another play. Uh, and that's kind of how I treat it. And in most cases, it, it worked. It was just to take the reverence away from the text right. and to kick it about and to just make it sound like spoken thought. Okay, it's in verse it, and it has a rhythm uh, that, that cannot be wholly destroyed, but don't worry about that. Find out what the line means, 
Find out why you're saying it. Find out how you want to say it, which is also dictated by the cue you get from the other actor and the way he said his line. Um, and that reaction uh, tells you um, how, how to speak your lines. Um, don't learn the lines and then um, regurgitate them. These are, these are the lines that I've learned. These are the lines that I'm going to say. Um, and you work out what they mean, um, and you say what they mean, and uh, and it's as boring as hell. Yes, <laughs> um, it's got to be a it's got to be alive. It's got to be alive. And if you if you want to suddenly pause in the middle of a line and pick your nose, do it. Do it. Yes. Well, I think I think there's so much that you bring up because I when I when I'm teaching in drama schools or helping young actors through Shakespeare. I often have ex say exactly the same thing, and th there's a, I, the first thing I say is that, of course, iambic pentameter. We're speaking all the time. It's the rhythm of English. Yes. Um, and if you think of it as maths, dot dash dot dash, you'll be paralysed. But if you just trust the punctuation and the line and the sense, it will carry you through like a conveyor belt. Do you know what yes. I mean? Yes. Yes. And it's not a recitation. You're not in your own. No. You're responding to, uh, to another human being speaking his or her thoughts. Absolutely, and I think again that's a, that's a brilliant uh, piece of advice because in the end, Shakespeare is about relationships. Yes, like any other play, you know, Hamlet and Lelia, Lear and Cordelia, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. It's a relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Shakespeare um, also gives you the, the the wonderful luxury of soliloquies. Yes, you can do what you like with that, and you are your own man. You don't depend on anybody else. You can kick that around as much as you want. As, as an actor, obviously, you've played a lot of the great Shakespearean roles, most of which have soliloquies. Yeah. Um, what, what, is the, what is the sensation of, of, of being alone on stage with those words communicating with an audience? Can you say a little about that? In the course of a play like Hamlet or Lear or any, any of the big ones, the small ones too, what am I talking about? Um, the whole of the Shakespeare canon. It's, it's a wonderful moment for an actor to be absolutely alone on the stage, absolutely not dependent on anybody or anything except himself, his thoughts and emotions, and the audience. Of all those things, probably the most important thing is the audience, um, because you can, you can be very satisfied and enjoying and happy with what you're thinking and saying. And it's soliloquy, you've been told, so you're saying it to yourself, but you're saying it out loud. But you're in a play, and you're doing it in front of an audience. And they've come to share your emotions and your thoughts and your feelings. So although it's a soliloquy and it's to yourself, it's spoken thought. It's spoken thought with a purpose to uh, engage and entertain and make think the people, maybe hundreds of people who are listening to you. And you're doing it, although you're, you're speaking inwardly into yourself, you're not doing it for you, you're doing it for the audience. And so at the same time, um, it can't be too inward because then you're not letting them in. They've got to come in too and share what you're thinking, what you're feeling, and how you're expressing it. Um, and the, the other thing about, about Shakespeare and, and about the, the, the Hamlet and the Lear, there, there's a, a feeling that the actor mustn't get laughed. Laughs are wonderful in tragedies. In a tragedy, you can get the audience to laugh. That's uh, not only clever, it's very satisfying. Well, certainly, I mean, Hamlet is a great wit. And, and, oh, well, yes. and Iago, Iago too. Yeah. I think, I think I'd like to just quickly say something that I struck me working on, on Shakespeare, particularly with the soliloquies, is we, because they're so powerful, we forget that the other, we, we, we become privy to the inner thoughts of a Hamlet or a Macbeth or an Iago. But we forget that the other characters don't. 
and I remember I'm, I'm going to be directing Macbeth in this in this um, season. If you take soliloquies out, the play is almost a quarter of the you know less. Yeah, and Lady Macbeth has no access to any of those soliloquies. And we forget Ophelia doesn't have access to Hamlet's or anybody has access to Iago's. So we're privy to it, but but no one else is. And, and I realized that Shakespeare was the first great playwright to create introverted heroes. Yes, yes. Who, who was obviously um, the Greek plays, first they talk to publicly, but they never have a soliloquy. There's always a chorus on stage. And with Shakespeare, he created these men who couldn't necessarily communicate themselves to the women they loved or the friends they had and the only people they could talk to was themselves or the audience i once did um the, of the many productions of Hamlet that i've been in we it was rather interesting it so it, it it kind of worked that um the confrontation between hamlet and ophelia um the scene before polonius says walk you here that he used to wear by accident, may hear a French heel. Um, and we had Hamlet kind of overhearing and comes onto the stage and there she is. And she's not moving, she's not running away. So he's, she does the to be or not to be too bad. So she can hear it. Uh, and so at the end, when she says, how does your honor for this many a day? It, what the? I just told you where. Yes. You're a setup. I don't believe you at all. And he's on, on to her immediately. And it, it sort of worked. It's all. That's fascinating because uh, another one of the podcasts is with, is with uh, Joanna David and Edward Fox. Both he's played Hamlet, she's played Ophelia. And Joanna was saying the same thing that somehow Hamlet works out that it's a setup. Uh, she didn't see it as a setup from the beginning, but what you said, both of you have said the same thing that fundamentally, the reason he doesn't trust Ophelia is because he thinks they've been. She's... Yes, and um, if she's heard his thought, if he said it to her, and her first reaction is, How, how are you? It, it sets it up beautifully for the scene that's to come. Yes, and that makes sense of her reaction to it at the end, which leaves her, the noble mind is overcome. I can't yes, remember, uh, yes. What, what the line is. Absolutely. We'll get on to Hamlet in more detail in a second. Perhaps, perhaps you could say, because you've played a huge range of Shakespearean roles. Well, I've um, been around for so long. Yes, but, but, but one of the wonderful things about, about the last, this, this era of theatre is that actors are in a, such a wonderful range of Shakespearean roles. Can you say a little bit more about some that might have been highlights as, uh, other than Hamlet? Oh, I, th I, think, I think certainly the Lear, uh, which uh, I did here and, and, and in America, um, I, I never thought I was a Lear until, um, the director, Michael Grandage. Oh, yes. Said, um, look, now you're in your seventies. Um, uh, this was a while ago, I might add. Um, if you don't do it now, you'll be too old to do it because Lear needs a young man's energy. Um, uh, although you're, you're, Acting four score and ten, uh, whatever uh, you've got, it's an enormous, the enervating role, and uh, physically, vocally, mentally, emotionally, uh, but wonderful if you can get anywhere near it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's 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 wonderful for an actor. Well, um, Macbeth, I wasn't very good as Macbeth. I had to go. Why did you? Why do you? Why do you feel you weren't very good as my best? I don't know. I I I wasn't devious enough. I don't think. I'd love to have done it again. I did it at the old Bic, and uh, no, I I wasn't. Uh, I don't think I was meant to play Macbeth somehow. Hamlet, Lear, yes, yes. They they uh, both had my name on them, but not not Macbeth. I, I enjoyed it. I loved. I loved playing it. But I knew that I wasn't. I wasn't hitting it. I wasn't making it. No, no. I, I had to do my own thing eventually. But it was. It was run of the mill. There was nothing special about it at all. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because Macbeth, in many ways, is as sensitive as Hamlet, but his personality is far darker. 
Yes, yes. Hamlet has Macbeth crushes it himself. Yes, yes. I, I, I think I, I enjoyed playing the sensitivity, uh, which um, in Macbeth is is kind of false. Uh, it sensitivity doesn't really work in Macbeth. Um, it's there, but uh, you can't overdo it. And I think I overdid it. Um, I would have been. I'd have been a better lady, Macbeth, I think. It's a good part. It is a very good part. <laughs> a very good part. Speaking of Leah, um, uh, I mean, that's a vast emotional journey. And I think when, when I read that for the first time as a young man, that play, so I'm also a brother um, and a son, I was a son, and um, the, the power of that play is huge. But that's, a, again, a, as you say, a titanic emotional journey that Leah goes through. How did you, because uh, what's, you have to go from that, the, the the rage you know and the and the and the uh, irascibility to this far more soulful and vulnerable um when he goes through the fire doesn't he how how was how did you navigate that wow yeah <laughs> um i i i think i was helped by the fact that when i played it first it was at the donmar it was a it, i was doing it in a very intimate space so there was nothing big or grand or, you know, the temptation to be, to, to, to be big and huge. And I could be intimate. I could be, I could be Leah, but on, on a kind of uh, the right scale of that space. And then I did it in bigger theatres. I did it in a huge theatre in New York. York. Um, and... That was pretty scary. That was pretty scary. But it was wonderful because I'd all, I'd grounded myself at the Donmar. I knew what I was doing. It was just a question of turning up the volume, turning up all the knobs, just turning them up a bit, um, and and it worked. I mean, I I loved playing Leo as much as I loved as a young man uh, playing Hamlet. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful role for an actor because it it asks like Cameron, it does it asks everything of an actor everything. It's the heights and the lows of the drama, the the good and the evil, the 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 horrible suffering and the incredible kindness. And the poetry is absolutely stunning. Yes, and the wonderful journey. They're both amazing journeys. But uh, most of Shakespeare's um, big characters are wonderful journeys for actors. Yes. Uh, and and you you get the added bonus of being able to show off, and actors love showing off. Yes, certainly with a big ego like Lear has. Oh yes, yes, he's very much the centre of his world. <laughs> oh yes, yes. I, I think you're very. I mean, I think Groundage is a wonderful director of 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 not just Shakespeare but also Marlowe and other poetic dramatists. Yeah, yes. And I think you're right. I think in our modern age, Shakespeare and intimate spaces almost works better than 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 big spaces because suddenly it becomes very real yes i i quite agree with that uh, playing um hamlet in a small space and i played in beast but i played hamlet at elsinore um in denmark in the castle um in the inner keep of the castle and then i directed ken branner um as hamlet playing it outside the castle with the ramparts it's the background. So we had the ghosts walking along the ramparts. Amazing. It's very exciting. So which brings us on to Hamlet, which which obviously has played a massive role in your life. Where do you start? What is it about the role that you think is so special for you? Well, I think of all the of all the characters, Hamlet is the big personality role. Doesn't matter who you are, you don't have to dress up for it. You don't have to look like anything but yourself. You don't need any makeup. Uh, actresses have played Hamlet and got away with it. Um, it it's it, it is the personality. Um, I am I'm virtually me. I say I sound like me. I don't have to put on any kind of voice or accent. As I say, I don't have to wear makeup. Um, wear, wearing black clothes helps, but uh, but that apart, I'm me mm. being Hamlet. And I think every Hamlet is themselves being Hamlet. And, and so, it, in a way, you can relax into Hamlet. 
You don't have to become him. You are him. So there's something universal about the part, you think? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I, I was sort of the right age. The last time I played Hamlet, I was getting a bit old for it, I think. But fortunately, I didn't look too old. I could still look the right, the right age. And that, that helped enormously. Um, but, but for me, I was Hamlet. I, I, I was Hamlet. Um, and so, in a way, that made it not easier, but um, it was a key. It was a key that opened the door. One of the fascinating things about Hamlet is his indecision, if that's the right word, or his reluctance to be a Macbeth. There's always that feeling that Shakespeare loved to always do it differently to everybody else. That, that you know, he, that revenge tragedy was being written everywhere. There was the Spanish tragedy by Thomas Kidd, the Revengers tragedy by Tuller. Um, and it always feels like Shakespeare, right, I'm going to write a revenge tragedy, but my revenger isn't going to want to do it. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, it's going to take all evening thinking about it. So how do you make, because obviously the appeal of a, of a revenge tragedy is its dynamism, whereas the whole point in Hamlet is that the revenge is deferred right to the end. How does one make that dynamic, exciting? Well, Shakespeare does. Yes. Well, Shakespeare throughout throughout uh, the play, um, which, as you say, is a revenge tragedy, um, peppers the play with fantastic scenes. Um, the scene with Ophelia, you know, what's that got to do with killing your uncle? Um, very little, if anything. The the play the play scene, okay, is to see how the king reacts. But it, it, it's whimsical, almost. Um, and so Shakespeare peppers the entire play um, with other wonderful scenarios. So al although the revenge theme is constant, um, it never becomes boring. No. It never becomes the only um, dynamic behind that scene. There, there are many others. The, 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 the wonderful scene with Gertrude including the killing of Polonius. You, Shakespeare puts up a, a murder in the middle of that scene with his mother. I mean, it's, it's brilliant. It's wonderful. And it, uh, um, as well as keeping the audience on the edge of their seats, what's going to happen next? What's he going to do next? For Christ's sake, kill your uncle. Get on with it. As the ghost says. Yeah, and the ghost comes on to remind him what it's all about. Um, but that's the brilliance of the play. Yes. It's juggling all the time. Everything you say is is, is riveting. And I, I think um, one of the things that's so interesting is you mentioned the murder of Polonius, is that in many ways Hamlet kills more people than anybody else in the play. He's a mass murderer by the end. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And yet we see him as this great figure of, of beauty and moral good. And do you know what I mean? No, I mean, he could even murder at, at a distance when he sends Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Yes, absolutely. For me, what's fascinating about it is that the reason he can't act is because he's also dealing with realising his entire world is not what he thought it was, that it's full of lies and deceit and murder and, and corruption, isn't it? He's facing yeah, it. Absolutely. I mean, he was he was on his way to be a conventional prince. Yes. Um, until that wretched ghost yes. came along. Um, it, it, it was a happy ever after until, until that happened. Um, brilliantly done by, by Shakespeare. Um, I mean, what a wonderful, wonderful opening on on the battlements, um, and there, there, the, the the guardsmen frightened. What are they frightened of? They're frightened of a ghost. Hamlet's his father to come back as a ghost. Um, I mean, it's it's thrilling. It, it's it's off the board, um, and uh, uh, that is what makes the play so so unique, and so and then. Um, giving everybody in the play the most wonderful things to say and the most wonderful thoughts to think and the most wonderful actions to do. Um, it's miraculous. Well, also you highlight something else is that is that again when you you started the podcast mentioning about 
uh, getting rid of the reverence. Yeah. He had a huge audience, most of whom, many of whom couldn't read and were illiterate. Yeah. And he knew exactly how to create thrilling drama. Yeah. Inserting a ghost, inserting witches, inserting battles. Yeah. Yeah. He gave them things to look at, think about, and they didn't have to be intellectual to do that. They didn't, you know, as you say, they didn't have to be able to read and write. What they saw that made them think and feel was what it was all about. And it, and he knew how to create spectacle as, as you know, things like The Tempest with, with Ariel and, and Midsummer Night's Dream with Park and Bon. Um, he knew how to take the audience on a journey. Yeah, he knew all about fantasy. Yes. I remember teaching um, students at uh, a drama school and we were doing The Tempest, which is a crazy idea considering The Tempest is, is about maturity. <laughs> uh, uh, and I said to them, the language is the CGI. Uh, the language, the way the characters speak is how he creates the magical world around him. Whereas now we just create it on screen with, you know, computers and special effects. Yeah. Listening to the words gave you that wonderful visual. I played Prospero a number of times and uh, that the opening 20 minutes is practically all, all Prospero's describing and setting up all all this magic and it's 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 wonderful yes but i remember the first time i did it um waiting in the wings waiting for the curtain to go up knowing that you've got nearly 25 minutes of talk ahead of you it must be a wonderful thing we have played all those roles prospero Macbeth, hamlet Lear, so many great parts um and he does provide such richness for actors and directors um, if you were giving some advice to a, a young actor now starting out with Shakespeare, what would you, what would you say? I would say, um, don't let anybody tell you that it's special because it ain't. It was a man, whoever he was, of the theater writing for the theater. If he, if there is poetry, kick it about, treat it as prose. If his prose, pick it into shape, treat it as poetry. Don't ever be afraid of what you're saying. Always try to understand what you're saying. And that, with Shakespeare, is not always easy because you can, you can sometimes understand, but you, you read it and you think, but is that what he's saying? I, yes, I can understand what that means, but he's, he's saying it in a, in a very flowery um, way um, that will land on an audience's ear um, in, a, in a very strange way. They wouldn't be used to having ordinary things expressed extraordinarily. So you've got to put the ordinariness back into the extraordinariness because you're not doing it for yourself, you're doing it for them. And if they're not with you, you're on a hiding to nothing. Wonderful. And if there was one thing you'd like to say, just to sum up about why Shakespeare is still important and we need to keep him alive? Well, he was he, probably the best playwright ever. Um, and the best audience pleaser ever. Uh, he had the best plots, the best characters, and the best language. Uh, what more do you want? Uh, he was, and I have to say, whoever he was, uh, he was the best. Well, that's absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Sir Derek Jacobi. That was an absolutely fantastic conversation. Thank you for everything. My great pleasure. That was Sir Derek Jacobi sharing with us a lifetime of performing Shakespeare. To find out more about the Durham Shakespeare Festival 2023, go to www.elysiumtc.co.uk.